afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on transforming healthcare with Viz AI. We're going to be discussing how we can improve access, streamline care, and gain efficiencies. I am Prembachu Green, and I am delighted to be your host for this exciting session today. <laughs> We're going to be diving into how Viz AI is shifting the paradigm for care, and we'll also have the opportunity to hear from two prominent executive thought leaders who have successfully implemented Viz across their institutions. Wendy Elliott from Marcus Neuroscience Institute and Stephanie Henry from University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> All right, as we get started, I'd love to take a moment to begin the discussion thinking about addressing the pressing need for a transformation in healthcare. Some of the key challenges that we've heard from healthcare providers time and again is the lack of immediate access to critical health data like imaging, patient medical records, and multiple handoffs between care teams that can lead to delays in diagnoses and treatment for patients. Wendy and Stephanie, would you agree or have you heard other, other challenges that you think are some of the key gaps that you've seen? Totally agree. Um, I think, again, ensuring the right level of care, particularly as institutions and as hospitals develop um, feeder hospitals and, and primary stroke versus comprehensive and being able to get the identification of those transfers fast is really appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Stephanie, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. As I and UPMC look at program growth across the system, I really think that um, any kind of artificial intelligence really improves the ability to communicate and to help with that care coordination. Wonderful. I think this is great. What we're hoping to focus on today is exactly that. How does AI support care teams to coordinate care and optimize patient outcomes? I think one of the key goals there is how do we empower care teams to make those informed decisions and how does AI support with that so we can get these patients to the appropriate level of care and get them the access that they need across your health systems. Mm -hmm. uh, as we move on, what I'd love to do is take a few minutes just to provide a brief overview of this um, and what we're looking to solve here overall. So as we think about uh, what this does, it is an AI-powered triage and care coordination platform designed to streamline care for acute and non-acute conditions. By harnessing the power of artificial intelligence, automation, and parallel communication, Viz AI helps facilitate faster treatment decisions. Let's take a quick look at how this actually works. So let's say a patient arrives at the emergency department or an outpatient diagnostic center to undergo testing. The images are automatically sent to the cloud where the Viz AI algorithms are run to identify the disease. If there's an abnormality that's detected, alerts are sent to the appropriate care team members so that they can view the images on their phone or their desktop. This allows them to make a more informed decision on the most appropriate care pathway for that patient. Now, one of the things that's wonderful in terms of the way that we look at how care is delivered is thinking about how you streamline access with these types of technologies. Viz AI provides a platform solution that addresses the needs of your care teams across the health system. It covers over seven disease areas and it's dedicated to ensuring that patient outcomes are backed by real world evidence. One of the unique things that we look at here when we think about real world evidence is how does that impact what types of solutions are available to our patients. Viz AI was the first software company to be granted the new technology add-on payment from CMS. CMS grants this to provide access to innovative technologies that are able to demonstrate substantial clinical improvement to their beneficiaries. Because of Viz AI's proven impact, in 2023, that NTAP payment was permanently incorporated into stroke-related PRD. It's a very exciting time for all of us. 
one of the key things to look at in terms of the evidence that's been generated with the use of the technology in over 60 um, plus publications is that there's an ability to reduce a disability um, up to an hour of reduction in time to treatment, three and a half fewer days in the hospital, ability to ensure patients are receiving the right level of care, whether it's with your spoke or your pub hospital, a 5.6x increase in patients being referred for continual care and management within your health system. I think that the, the added benefit overall across all of this is that the value from improved outcomes leads to a significant impact on the total cost of care. What we'd love to do is take a quick moment here to pull the audience and take a minute to read the question and respond to the poll. This, this question is really important to us because I think technologies are introduced to hospitals. It's always important to consider some of the key elements that are important to clinicians and administrators as these decisions are made. We're gonna continue to discuss these next steps in our, with our next two speakers as well. Let's see if we have here. Waiting a few more minutes. Almost. As we wait for everyone to finish the poll results, I'd love to take a minute here to introduce our next speaker, Wendy Elliott. Wendy is an exceptional healthcare leader and a recognized expert in the field of neuroscience. As <laughs> Vice President of the Marcus Neuroscience Institute in Boca Raton Regional Hospital at Baptist Health South Florida. She brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to our webinar today. Wendy's passion for enhancing the patient experience and optimizing healthcare outcomes is truly inspiring. Her deep understanding of the complex landscape of neuroscience has allowed her to implement transformative initiatives that improve access, streamline care processes, and leverage cutting edge technologies to benefit patients and healthcare providers alike. Today, we're privileged to have Wendy as our presenter, sharing her invaluable insights. Please welcome Wendy as she shares her expertise and guides us through the impact of Viz AI on patient care at Marcus Neuroscience Institute. Thank you, Prem. I appreciate that. Thank Everybody you. Too. Are we ready to move forward? Okay, here we are. So just to tell you a little bit about myself outside of what Prem just said, um, I am a speech language pathologist by training. So I've been in the neuro world pretty much my entire career and I'm not even gonna go how long that is because we don't need to know that, but really, really have had an affinity for understanding and uh, wanting to do better with our stroke patients. You know, I remember when there wasn't much that we could do and I would get them in the post-acute side of things and not being able to do anything, but just hope that some somehow my therapy makes them a little bit better. And then with all the Dawn trials and all the other advances in medicine, we know now time is brain and the faster that we can get to those individuals, the better that they have outcomes. We know that stroke is one of the well, I think it's the top dis disabling uh, disease process that we have right now. People don't necessarily pass away from a stroke, but they do have disables, uh, disabilities that really impact their, their life. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit at a high level. You know, first talking about Baptist Health South Florida, they are one of the top um, nonprofit employers in South Florida. There's a lot of Baptists out there, but Baptist Health South Florida is only from Palm Beach County all the way down into the Keys. We have about 23,000 employees, 4,000 doctors. We have 11 acute care hospitals and all of them use Viz at this point. So we're excited about being able to utilize that as a system. We're most awarded in the South Florida area by US News and World Report. And we do a lot from a community standpoint to help our constituents in our community. Boca Regional was uh, partnered with Baptist Health South Florida, actually the first of July, it'll be four years. So we've had the pleasure of being able to work with them uh, and during our most trying times with COVID and everything else, which is was really beneficial for us. There are two other facilities to the north of us that Baptist purchased about two 
uh, years prior to us that now uh, instills the North region. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But Boca Regional has 2,843 employees, 900 physicians. We have six outpatient facilities, 400 licensed beds here. We're going through major campus expansion. So hopefully we'll be able to increase that because I don't know if most of you are aware, but everybody moved to Florida during COVID because of the, you know, they, they figured if they're working from home, they could work in paradise like we all do. So we appreciate them being here. We just need to have the space to be able to take care of them. And you can see some of our volumes here and some of our accolades um, just at this hospital here. Here's um, the the heat map of where Baptist Health South Florida is located. You you know, there's a busy slide, but this is just to say, you know, we go everywhere from Palm Beach County all the way down to you know to Key West with our outpatient or our physician practices or uh, our hospital and acute care facilities. We also have a neuroscience institute that's in our Miami campus. And so we collaborate and partner quite a bit just in terms of making sure that order sets and processes and policies are all on the same page and are all following the same uh, clinical pathways for each other. And it's been a real uh, pleasure to be able to get to know them in the South as well as getting them to understand and see where we are. And here's a picture of what our building used to look like. It does not look like that right now. There's full construction going on. So just to talk a little bit about Marcus Neuroscience Institute in particular. So it was established in 2014 via a gracious gift from um, Mr. and Mrs. Bernie Marcus, who is the co-founder of Home Depot. He lives here six months out of the year. He also lives in Atlanta. And if you got any of you guys are from Atlanta, you know that the Marcus name is all over the place there as well. So we've been very, very fortunate to have him as one of our biggest philanthropic supporters, as well as he's actively engaged with a lot of what we do here and we always you know, utilize him as, as a resource. We have a 20 bed neuro step down and intensive care unit and another 20 um, bed neurosurge. And we're all in the same building. So it's easy access for our physicians to go up and down through the floors and see patients inpatient wise or in the clinic. We have dedicated OR rooms, INR rooms, uh, interoperative MRI, CT, and our physician uh, clinic, like I said, is attached. In this uh, north region, we have the two primary stroke facilities, which is in uh, the Boynton area, and then we have uh, our comprehensive center, which is here at Marcus. And combined, we see about 1,200 strokes alerts, stroke alerts a year. We also um, see about 1,000 coded strokes out. So that's quite a big number for the three facilities, which is a total of about 900 beds together. So here you can see the capture area for the North region, uh, Bethesda East and West. We have two campuses and then the Boca Regional, that's the comprehensive. Um, again, through philanthropic support by Mr. Marcus and the Marcus Foundation, we've been able to really capitalize on getting the latest technology and equipment. Uh, we have the Icono um, biplane and we also have the Corendus robot, which you know is still in its uh, stages of being developed and utilized, but potential someday to do remote thrombectomies and aneurysms, which is really exciting. Um, we were the first in Florida to also get this and um, I think we, we were one of the early adopters in 2019, in April of 2019, to be able to utilize that. We were utilizing another, um, another company for some of the detection, but again, it wasn't as mobile. It had to be at a desktop and it wasn't, didn't have the communication components of it. So we quickly were able to shift over to that. And one of our physicians was one of the, um, the physicians that started the transradial approach and actually does training and teaching. Along with the Marcus Foundation, we have had collaborations with Emory and Grady in Atlanta, which has given us like a, a breadth of ability to utilize their skills and abilities there. Um, they also provide our telemedicine services at our, our telestroke services at our Bethesda campuses right now. So we've really enjoyed having that relationship with them to be able to explore research, to be able to continue to do all the things in stroke that we want to make sure that we provide the best care to our constituents here. So before we leverage the AI platform, it was, like I said, very difficult for us to share imaging. You know, they'd have to log on to PACS, they'd have to have credential at the other facility. And it was just a lot of um, time consumption that we knew that we didn't have because we needed to get to those patients fast and decisions needed to be made. We spent a lot of time waiting on phone calls, calling people in, making sure that you know the right person was at the bedside. 
so on and so forth. And then the transfers that were coming in from our sister facilities were not appropriate transfers. So we were wasting, like Prim, I think, had on her uh, slides, you know, it's $56,000 of transfer. And if they're not coming here for any intervention, then we could definitely keep them at our primary facility. So we wanted to make sure that we had the resources to read the scans from there and be able to modify and, and look at what we needed to do from a treatment standpoint to get the best care. So here, I'm gonna take a little time like Prim and just do a poll. Those of you out there that have this uh, or any AI powered care coordination solution, what's the top reason that you would want to use this for? Is it to streamline transfers? Is it to expedite time to treatment? Is it to improve patient outcomes? Or is it to support better hospital economics? Now, I, there's not an all above, so you have to choose, I think, um, but I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to go through that. Okay, I'm going to see what you say. All right, improve patient outcomes looks like the top header here expedite time to treatment, which is all of our goals, no matter if you're hitting that, you know, 30 minute mark, 20 minute mark, we always want to do better, right? Okay, for us, um, it was it was to expedite the time for our transfer. So streamlining those transfers was definitely something that we wanted to, to look at specifically. And so uh, obviously, we all want to improve the patient outcomes and speed has that uh, helps that happen. So the three ways that this helped us streamline our transfers or our work was it streamlined the transfers. We were able to see the CTP, CTAs, and all of the, the imaging from our sister facilities and being able to say, yeah, get them here because we're going to do intervention. So that expedited the time door in, door out of our primary campuses, being able to bring them here and get them into the IR suite uh, for any potential care that they needed there. And of course, that obviously, because it uh, reduced the time, our outcomes improved, and it also reduced the length of stay, because we know if the patients come in and they recover very, very well because we get that treatment done, they don't stay in our hospital that long. And you'll see, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about our um, length of stay. So the impact of this for us, particularly around the transfers, you can see here, um, in 2020, we had 32 patients transferred, only nine of them needed an intervention. 2021, 42 were transferred, 11 needed intervention, 2022, 48 and 16. So you can see it's enabled us to do a more appropriate transfers. The ones that didn't need transferred were very able and capable of being taken care of at our primary because we've made sure that the clinical skills are there and that they can take care of those. The other thing that it did it's, it helped us with the communication to easily share information about that patient. So before the patient even got here, our staff, our doctors, our nurses, our stroke clinicians knew a lot about the patient already, not just the scans, but they were being communicated with by our sister facility because we had the means to do that. And actually the pre-alert with EMS coming in from another facility was able to utilize this through the race score. So one of the things that we've started implementing is, um, you know, being able to get the race scores from the field and calling in the IR team because we know that that's going to, to be a potential intervention. You can see here the engagement of our teams. Uh, the very first line here is we have something I, you know, I think is very important. And here at the Boca campus, we have what's called their stroke clinicians. They are 24 seven mm -hmm. that all they do is respond to stroke alerts and keep all the data real time. So they're at the bedside, they're at the ED, every time we have a stroke or a code gray is what we call our inpatients. And they're able to immediately assess the patient they wait for the physician to come down the residence or telestroke or whomever, but they're already in the ballpark of getting the, if they need TNK, getting that taken care of, getting them into imaging. They're basically the, you know, the, the workhorse that's like get, getting things going and keeping the rapid time moving forward. And then obviously the regular nurses and the vascular neurologists. So this I think is, is great to see because you see the engagement with all of our team when they're utilizing the VIS platform. Here's a case study that I'll talk about that was a transfer. Um, the stroke alert time to EMS 
the increase, you know, what, what our communication shows, increased awareness of the required imaging and prep of the team, and then it improved the process of our transfer time. So this was a 39-year-old female who was brought in by Delray EMS over to our Bethesda campus after being found unresponsive by her boyfriend. The last known well was 11 a.m. She arrived at 1617 into the, um, the Bethesda campus, immediately was taken in for advanced imaging, we saw that there was a need for her to come here for intervention and so door in door out is not as good as we would like it to be. Our goal is an hour, but it was an hour and a half. Um, we did get her from the door of the Boca campus into the IR suite with a groin puncture in 16 minutes. Door to recannulization was 47. And you can see the differences here. If you see my, my mouse, here's what it looked like when she first came in her scan. And here you can see all the reperfusion. Um, we have the stroke team there. But here's the great thing. You can see the conversations between the Bethesda campus, because Dr. Ferguson is from the Bethesda campus checking in on the patient. This is our neurointerventionalist, Dr. Snelling, who's talking about you know, what they found and what they're going to do. And you can see, again, our nurse practitioner, who is our stroke clinician, another stroke clinician here, and then you know all the communications about the patient. So we're sure that everybody knows what's going on. One of the cool things that this has now is a red button that we can actually deploy out to the team that tells the team that they need to come in for an intervention. And, um, you know, it's it's something that is great, you know, instead of having to pick up the phone and say, you know, you have to come in because we have a patient that needs care, you know, we can automatically deploy that and they get that and they know that it's time to come in for that. When we look at our lengths of stay, our lengths of stay average in 2022, 2023 was four days. Now here you can see all the different types of strokes, you know, that can be, but the average was four days. Our goal was 7.8 days. So we're well exceeding our goals in terms of length of stay, showing that we are getting to those patients faster. We are getting them uh, out of the hospital even faster and better yet, their discharge disposition. We have 54% of our patients going home usually with home health. Now, the average age of our patients here in Boca is 74 years old. Now, 74 year old here is probably not the same as it would be you know, in a rural community, but they're very healthy 74 year olds. And so we wanna make sure that we continue to give them that healthy lifestyle that they're used to and what they expect. So with faster communication and treatment times, the patients are experiencing better outcomes and it shows with our data. One of the things that Prim, talked about, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the NTAP, is the ability for our organization. So we were, you know, fairly early adopters. I think it started in October of 2020. Um, usually an NTAP, if you don't know what that means, it's new technology add-on payment, which means that um, it has been approved to get an additional payment on top of uh, what you normally would get for the DRG for a stroke. So that being said, we, we jumped on that right away and there was a code that we put into all of our billing. And this is primarily with the Medicare patients. Uh, that's all we did. And we were able to actualize over $800,000 in the period of two years that it was in place, which was huge. It allowed us to buy additional VIZ applications. It allowed us to you know, purchase the applications for our sister facilities so that we were able to, to see everything that was happening. So, um, you know, we had 154 patients that qualified in four months. And then the NTAP fee that we were getting at that point in time was a, up to 1,040. Now, obviously this was based on your cost. So if you, you know, didn't have any additional cost over your DRG, then you didn't get an NTAP payment. But if you did, you could receive up to $1,040. So that was, that was huge for us, like I said. The other thing that really was instrumental is when NTAP went away in two years, it usually lasts for three years, when it went away in two years, um, Medicare increased the DRG by 13 point, well, average, average of all the, the top three stroke DRGs, an average of $1,358. Now that's more than what the NTAP was giving us. So that's 4.1%. So thanks to this and being able to add this NTAP on there, it was, it was a viable option for Medicare to increase the DRG rates for all of those um, stroke DRGs. So, you know, again, anything we can get is better because we know that 
you know, our expenses continue to go up and particularly with all the things that were um, related to COVID. And, you know, so what we're looking forward to now is being able to continue to utilize the additional VIZ applications. We've already um, started using the aneurysm packet and we've already been able to identify those unruptured aneurysms that wouldn't have probably been detected uh, or wouldn't have been noticed. So we're excited about that. We've started an aneurysm clinic. A lot of them don't need to have surgical intervention at this time, but they do need to be aware of it and they do need to know what their options are and be checked on a regular basis. They have, um, you know, the SAH and the ICH program that, you know, we're also getting ready to establish uh, here soon. And our pulmonologists or our interventional radiologists are looking at the PE um, component of it. So that's going to be very important for them to utilize. And then, of course, the upcoming ones that I'm excited um, for Viz to, to roll out and not sure where we are in terms of uh, getting them ready for uh, market, but that's it. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing that amazing journey um, of the Market Stroke Institute and how Viz is supported with the program success. Um, next, I'm going to be welcoming Stephanie Henry from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Stephanie is a highly accomplished healthcare professional and an influential figure in the field of stroke care. As the program director of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Stroke Institute, she brings a wealth of expertise and deep passion for improving patient outcomes. She has championed the integration of cutting edge technologies and best practices in stroke care delivery. Her in-depth understanding of the complex dynamics within healthcare systems help her effectively drive change and improve care coordination for stroke patients. Her vision and leadership have played a pivotal role in shaping the stroke program at University of Pittsburgh. So please welcome Stephanie as she shares how Viz has helped enhance stroke care and improve patient outcomes across her center. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Prem, and great presentation, Wendy. Thank you very much for joining us today. I am here to share with you our success story at UPMC with the implementation of artificial intelligence. Um, again, my name is Stephanie Henry, and I've been with UPMC for 24 years. I've always worked in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery in one way or another. I started off back at the bedside in, in 1999, so I am gonna give away my age. And um, I've worked not just at the bedside, but I was a primary care nurse as well, as well as a unit director of stroke and rehab facilities. And so it's all encompassing when I think of stroke care and everything that I've seen um, throughout my whole entire role. Um, at UPMC. So I've been in my current position for about four years and my background has provided me with many different opportunities to focus on the best patient care that we can possibly give our patients. Um, we even have the outpatient um, center connected to us. So that's always um, an awesome opportunity to see your patients recover. Um, so let me just share here with you and I'll move my slides forward. So just to get started, um, a little bit about UPMC and um, the history on it. So we are rec world known and recognized for our center of organ transplantation. We're a leader in cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery, critical care medicine, trauma services, and our neurosurgery. On the left-hand side of your screen is our current status of how we look right now. And on the right-hand side is how we're going to look in the near future. Uh, they plan on the building to be completed in 2026, and I think it's going to be quite amazing. Um, UPMC Presbyterian is called the mothership um, in Presby terminology. Um, it was developed in 1893. It was a tertiary hospital that was to become UPMC's flagship, so UPMC Presbyterian was founded. In 1990, they changed the name of the university to um, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, or UPMC was adopted. Uh, we are an academic center that focuses on research, and we're also, um, we continue to merge with our community and our specialty hospitals, creating the first truly integrated healthcare program in Western Pennsylvania. Um, the next slide. It's a beautiful city. So, um, 
we are, whoops, I advanced too quickly. We are one of 41 nationally certified comprehensive stroke centers and UPMC has become a great and a huge vast resource and a referral center for the region since the 1990s. We utilize a one call system. We have a centralized med call system and also a newly developed platform through UPMC Enterprise called SAFR, in which our consults are placed and noted through um, a different platform. Uh, we get it both through our phone as well as on our desktops. And it, it's able to skip the med call operators and it goes directly to our physicians. Our physicians are available 24 seven by phone and by video to telestroke with any of our contracted locations and our UPMC locations. We provide outreach uh, to the referring hospitals and EMS. We assist in community hospitals with stroke protocol development, and we assist community hospitals with achieving and maintaining their primary or um, comprehensive stroke certifications. And our stroke, our stroke entire teeth, all of our outreach facilities, we're all encompassing. We have a multidisciplinary, and we start with 24-7 dedicated providers. So the population of Pittsburgh is, is truly pretty large. We It's roughly 303,000 people, which is a little bit less than the Philadelphia area. Um, and that's taken from the 2020 census, so just a little bit older. So, and it's known for its bridges. We have over 443 bridges in the Pittsburgh area. So um, travel by air and by ground can sometimes be complex with the amount of um, construction that's going on in and around each one of our community services. Our outreach, as you can see here on this slide, we have um, a large center um, of UPMC facilities that we tele with, and then also we have non-UPMCs that we tele with. So our outreach is very large. And our transfer patterns, we work with our strategic planning team to work on strategic planning for where our, where our outreach is going to go next and what that's going to look like. So it's it's very close communication with, with everyone. Um, the University of Medical Center, we have street three strategically placed comprehensive stroke centers, one thrombectomy capable center, 17 primary stroke centers, and two acute stroke ready centers. Um, so very large. We provide our services to 23 out of 33 of the UPMC acute care hospitals. We provide our telestroke services to 14 non UPMC sites. And like I said, we work very closely with our strategic planning um, committee and work on transfer processes and patterns to make sure that we get the patients to the right care. Located within Presbyterian Hospital is the Stroke Institute. We have 16 attendings, including three neuro IR fellows, five neurovascular fellows, a quality nurse coordinator, two telestroke coordinators, we do offer 24 seven inpatient coverage. We have a multi-tiered telestroke service line in which we have our attendings, our first call, our first very call is our fellows. Then our second call, if they need to go to video is our attending. And then we developed a three tiered backup system to that, just to make sure that everybody can get on camera fast enough and that our patients can get to the level of location that they need in order to care for them. Our target population is Eastern Ohio, Western West Virginia, Northern West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, and Western Maryland. And then we serve those patients who are identified with a stroke risk factor, uh, large vessel occlusions, intracranial aneurysms, and patients with acute or ischemic or um, a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, and as you can see here, we really pay attention to our futile transfers for LVO or those that are in need of a higher level of care. The development of strategic planning and transfer plans based on population, ground versus air is very important um, in Pennsylvania because we do have the mountains to contend with and some weather related issues that come along with that. So why neuro, why neuro AI? Um, you know, when I thought about it, I love our artificial intelligence. I think deep diving into processes and just knowing that the growth that UPMC is, is seeing um, within the system and beyond, we realized that we need to redefine and simplify our workflow process. Um, with so many different telestroke sites and the visual roadmap has definitely grown over the past several years, the use of automated image processing uh, platform was definitely needed in our facility. 
Um, so we took a look at three different platforms, really kind of deep dived into each three of the platforms and decided to go with Viz AI. It made the most sense to us. Um, our providers were um, looking at images on packs um, at their desks, uh, really not allowing for that increased amount of communication that can occur through the Viz app, like, like Wendy had um, said previously. So really we're looking for software to improve our door to needle um, and our transfer patterns and what that looked like. So also, you know, the workflow um, was most definitely the most important thing for our providers, um, making sure that they had ease of use, um, the capability to bring it up on their cell phones, I think was very important for them as well. So we decided to go big um, in 2022. So we went live with our three largest sites, UPMC, Presby, Mercy, and Shadyside in January of 2022. Um, we methodically rolled it out across the UPMC system, and then we went to those that we contract with, um, had some key stakeholder meetings with that, some revamping of some contracts, and um, yeah, we're live with every single site that we have now um, with Viz. And so it allows us to communicate much, much better with all of the different sites that we, that we tally with. Um, and as you can see, we have a large number. Now this data is just April, 2022 to April, 2023, the amount of studies that we've completed at each one of the sites uh, for our totals. So our non-con um, CTs uh, is over 16,000, our CTA studies are over 16,000. Our CTPs are, are breaching near 3,000. Um, intracranial hemorrhage we also look at, um, and then our LVOs. So um, I'd like to take a poll of, of the audience. I know that we're focused on growth and the expectation of, of making the growth a little bit easier by the use of artificial intelligence. So by how much do you expect your patient volume to increase within the next 12 months? Um, is kind of what I'd like to learn from this seminar. Um, you know, do you, do you see your, your facilities decreasing in patient volume, no growth, 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50% growth? And I'll give the audience about 30 seconds to answer the poll. We all know right now in times of COVID and staffing shortages that we've had multiple different areas reach out. Um, wanting to offer and, and looking for guidance um, to help out in their programs. And we want to be able to provide that to them. Great. We'll go ahead and see what everybody answered. 10% growth. Good. 10%. 10% depending on how large your facility is can be a large percentage for sure. Great. So now, you know, looking back is now that we're dedicated to providing the best patient care that we can, we're dedicated to tracking where Viz brings in the UPMC values. So we've established metrics to track the areas, both pre and post Viz go live at our facilities. We look at our active users over time. We also look at um, the amount of views within five minutes from our providers. That's our expectation that we had set up. Um, our futile transfers, which are, are very important when you're looking at each one of our facilities. Our door to puncture times and our door to needle times also are a focus. So if I look at the UPMC views by role, our program is set up um, for acute telestroke that the very first provider that gets on, um, on a call with an outside facility and receives the alert from the outside facility is our fellow. Our fellow triages the call, and then we'll make a call to the attending and alert to the attending through our UPMC enterprise platform called SAFR. Um, that they have an LVO, a suspected LVO, and to get on camera. Um, whether it's to get on camera for an LVO, whether it's to get on camera to, um, to provide connect a place to the patient or any kind of recommendations, um, our first level, second level, third level um, has really helped us um, to increase those amount of times and the shorter amount of times 
in order to get the patient to us quickly. So as you can see, our fellow, our vascular neurologists are first and second um, number one providers that log on to this. Um, so as you can see in this slide, you know, I took a look at all of our outside facilities, both uh, primary and our thrombectomy capable. And I'll just, your eyes could go down to UPMC McKee's port, one of our outlying facilities, primary stroke, uh, pre-vis pre admission rates were 81 for the year. Our post-vis admission was 90. If we look at our transfers, that's the most important for me, right? Because we want to make sure that our patients we're transferring the right patients to the right location in the least amount of time. And also it's very important to keep those patients in the community, right? Because, you know, when they're, if they need to go to rehab, um, patients love to have family members visit. We feel like that helps with outcomes as well. So if we look at, you know, the number of pre-vis transfers for UPMC McKeesport was 26, whereas post-vis is now 19. So that's an 11% change. That's pretty significant to the patient population in that community to be able to stay and, and have McKeesport provide the care that they need and allowing um, the patients who truly need the higher level of care to come into the larger facilities or the comprehensive and, and thrown back to me capable facilities. Um, and also my second focus is really door to puncture time in our hubs. So these are our four hubs that we have um, strategically placed across Western Pennsylvania. And if I really truly look at Hammett, like I thought all of our, all of our sites are doing great with their numbers. Um, and when I look at UPMC Hammett, I said, hmm, like what was going on there? So pre-vis it was 60, um, the number of cases that we looked at post-vis it was 59. But if I look at our door to puncture, um, pre-vis, it was 85.5 and post it was 51. So that is such a significant, significant change in our minutes in which we're seeing patients. So we tweaked a couple of processes, made sure that we we're, you know, looking at things the right way and it's truly helped um, our door to puncture time in, in our hubs. So we continue to keep our pulse on our outcomes. Um, we're looking at our length of stay, our discharge MRS as well. Um, Wendy, um, we typically have around the same um, median uh, for age in the Pittsburgh area. It is um, predominantly a little bit older in our area. Uh, we also have, you know, the city of Bridges, the city of Steel, we have smokers, diabetes, hypertension, um, you know, so keeping a close eye on that as we monitor this. Once again, the data that I presented today was, was very high level. And as we continue to reach out to all of our UPMC sites, really looking and focusing on best patient care and base, best patient practices, I think is our number one goal. And making sure that our patients that are transferring are truly the ones that need the um, level of focus. Um, what are we gonna use VIS for next? So we also um, currently are utilizing the VIS Recruit platform. And that is being rolled out um, and multiple different neuroservice lines and service lines within the hospital are utilizing that. I know that uh, vascular surgery is using the Viz Recruit and a couple other cardiovascular um, is as well. And then we're also looking at the aneurysm that we can utilize. We do have uh, very robust neurosurgery practices uh, throughout our system. And um, their focus right now is to looking at that aneurysm, how best we can help our patients with that platform. Great. Great. Thank, you Thank you so much for sharing that, Stephanie. I think it was wonderful to hear from you as well as Wendy. We have a little bit of time now for Q&A. And of course, the questions have started rolling in and there's some great ones here. Um, here's a good one, Stephanie, maybe that you can answer. Uh, one of the questions that came up from the team here is, has the use of the software helped to reduce burnout with your care teams? Or how do you think it's helped impact that? Yeah, absolutely. So the previous process was everything went through the one call center, which is MedCall. Um, we noticed that the, there may be new agents to train. Um, there may be, um, nobody answering their cell phone, right? And allowing for that time to be shaved off quite significantly 
by simply chatting through the VIZ application has been definitely helping our attending physicians work-life balance 100%. Um, it also helps with the fellows just triaging it to begin with. They can review it with the neuro IR attendings at that, at that point in time as they all get alerted. And we can also alert our um, neuro IR um, techs and all of our teams, anesthesia, anybody that needs to respond with the push of that red button, you know, just to say, we have a patient coming in, get ready to come in and get ready for the case. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the key things you hear is the time it takes, you know, to be searching and identifying who the right specialist is that you're supposed to be calling, who's on call, how do we get a hold of them, and streamlining that with an app and I'm sure has supported your team as much as it has from previous to now, right? Right. Uh, great. Another question we have in the chat here from the audience. Uh, Wendy, this is a great one for you. What specific AI-driven features or capabilities of the care coordination platform have had the most significant impact on improving patient outcomes and optimizing healthcare delivery? I think as I indicated, you know, in, in looking at the case study, the, I mean, there's several that's really hugely impacted our uh, communication and our conversations is the, you know, the chat, you know, being able to look at the chat and being able to, to communicate with folks on the other end at a different hospital uh, about the scans that are being pushed to the phone. And again, I think Stephanie and I both talked about that. They don't have to open up packs. They have their phone. If they're in bed, they can roll over and look at the scan, even if it's a, a secondary scan or whatever, and they don't need to get up and get on their computer. And right there, it shows exactly what happens. So I think the care coordination is huge. And then going back into the notification of the team, if it is an LVO and it's something that you know everybody agrees on, then being able to get that team here fast is important as well. Yeah, I love that. I think it's it's really interesting in terms of the number of team, the care team members that are involved in the process right. and being able to all get them in one room essentially, right? To be able to speak through what's happening and they're able to do that through the app right. itself. Um, this kind of ties into that question and part of that discussion. I guess this is great for both you and Stephanie to answer, but the audience is looking to understand how long did it take to implement and get trained on this? And does that mean all of your IR staff, your nursing, your techs, how, you know, what was the time frame around that and how did you manage getting access for all of them? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, okay. Wendy, that'd be great. So, so it, it was it was relatively easy. You know, I, we were very um, excited about how easy it was. The adaptation took longer for some than others. I think probably some of our, um, you know, physicians who were util who were used to using the other platform didn't want to give up the other platform as easily. Uh, but you know, when they started seeing the communication and the conversations coming over, then they knew that you know that that was what they needed to to do. So training was really simple: put it on your phone, start using it. That was really not difficult at all. Yeah, I agree with Wendy. It was it was very simple to roll out with the help of Viz, of course. Um, they put together packages, uh, they put together videos that we could show our providers and to walk them through the steps. I sat down with many of our providers just to make sure that they were loading it on their phone correctly. We did have a, you know, a couple of IT glitches, but they were simple to walk through. Uh, we use multifactorial authenticator here. So to really make sure that HIPAA is, is huge, um, is, is one of UPMC's uh, big proponents. Um, so it was, it was very simple. Now, some of our outlying facilities, I do monitor on who all has um, the application on their phones. Like for those that are in central Pennsylvania, um, the ED directors, the stroke coordinators, any of their stroke champions um, do receive um, the app location on their phone. Um, when we realized, when we first rolled it out, everybody was getting um, the Viz AI app. And I really needed to make sure that it was narrow and it was those providers that needed to have it and, and that were in charge of those patients. So once I, you know, once I figured out who they were, who are our key stakeholders that needed that app, it, it was a very simple rollout. I think the support um, as well, like Stephanie said, from the Viz team was amazing. We had 
a lot of false positive initially, and we couldn't figure out what was happening. Because again, you know, we were we were um, early adopters, so we were like, it's supposed to work. And of course, this gives you know a lot of the um, the ability to negate the ability for it to like identify. So we found out that we were positioning our patient in a different position and it was like setting off the LVO. So they came in and we figured that out really fast so that they were instrumental in that. Yeah. That's when you go add on to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Stephanie. I was just gonna say that's a great point that Wendy made. I think um, our customer success team and the ability to engage you all to support and optimize those workflows is definitely a critical area that, that helps with the outcomes that you're gonna be able to see. Mm -hmm. One of the things I was going to say is is turnover, right? As as the world faces turnover right now in their individual facilities, um, one of our weak points was radiology, right? And the the amount of techs that were triaged in and out of of the of the um, radiology department, making sure that they knew to send those that they had to do an one extra step of an additional push. Um, so sometimes I was seeing those at the very beginning of the pandemic when a lot of the shuffling was going around, but that was quickly identified by the VIZ team and, and corrected. Yeah, that's great. You know, this, this ties nicely into another question that came up. It's how did you, you and your teams decide which software to choose? Stephanie, we can start with you and then we'll jump over to Wendy. Sure. So we had utilized um, Rapid for research. Um, so we, that was one of the platforms that we had to take a look at um, because we had already had it. But, you know, there were a couple of different nuances that we um, liked with Viz that Rapid didn't have to offer, such as the alerts and, and things of that nature directly to the phone. We took a look at another platform that was not FDA approved at that time. Um, and just decided with Viz and all the communication and knowing how far our reach out had to be um, between our facilities, we have very remote facilities um, that IT can be very difficult um, at those individual locations, both our UPMC and non-UPMC facilities. So truly it was is putting um, all three on the table, taking a look at all three, what their pros, what their cons were, and we chose Viz. That's great. I when think for us, it. yeah, for us, it was a challenge. Um, our radiology group loved Rapid. Um, you know, they were doing other sources of research with them and um, didn't really feel the need to change. However, um, the interventionalists and our team that, you know, are responding to those are like, well, we don't ever get to see it. You know, we're waiting on you to be able to call it and you know being able to see it they would get an email or something but they they didn't have the opportunity to to have it as rapidly or communicate so for the first year we had both because they were you know they were utilizing it through a re through continued research but i think we slowly won them over and so now everybody's you know pretty much using you know the Viz platform on their phone and you know uh one of the the biggest proponents yesterday just said, you know, I love looking at my phone when I'm in bed and being able to determine it. So that's a huge win for us. Yeah, that's great. I think, you know, one of the key things that stuck out there to me as you were talking, Wendy, is the fact that you've now got a more cohesive communication opportunity between yeah. your radiologists and your, your specialists and allowing them to communicate together on that platform, right? And I'm sure that's yeah. been a little bit of a, the opportunity to improve what was happening before. And so it sounds like that's really helped your system overall. Well, and what's really helped too, is we have an outside group, like I said, Emory doing our telestroke at, you know, the other campuses and they get to see this too. So it's like, yeah. that's been huge for them to be able to, you know, to have a piece of that and know what's going on and being able to communicate with their stroke clinicians and our transfer team and, and that. So, that's been a big asset. Absolutely. Um, okay, another question that we have that came up is, and I think both of you kind of touched upon this, are all the sending centers within your health system, how do you address the transfers from outside your health system or outside your county? I know Stephanie, you talked a little bit about that, a lot of the centers outside of um, the UPMC network, but being able to see that communication and 
coordinate with them. Could you add a little bit more around that? Sure. We do tons of community outreach uh, with each one of our facilities, both UPMC and non-UPMC facilities, and we've really developed really great working relationships with each one of those facilities. We bring together, you know, hospital leadership, stroke coordinators, our stroke champions, and medical directors of emergency rooms to really um, push out education, um, give them education, allow them to come to us for any type of education and questions that they were to have, really make that open door communication policy between us and the outside facilities. We do have a very large multidisciplinary like EMS team. We um, have multiple different companies that are out there. So building those relationships with your EMS um, pre-hospital facilities, I think is very, very important as well. But um, truthfully, it's, it's, we receive an outlying facilities um, images through Viz. Our providers are able to look at them and provide right away feedback to their sites, I think is the most important. And then we do give them quality data on a um, normal basis in which we provide the feedback to both our EMS crews that bring the patients to us as well as to the facilities as part of our, our quality outcomes. So it's truly building those relationships um, then making just adjustments in their contracts, you know, based off of patient volumes at each one of those facilities, taking a look at how many times they give us a telephone call or, or they reach out, kind of tapping us on the shoulder for any kind of questions um, and work those into the contracts and then talk about outcomes, right? We talk about, you know, keeping the patients at their own facility at the, those primary care facilities and then the cost of transfer. So when you talk about costs, you talk about patient satisfaction, which is huge. Um, and then you talk about, um, you know, just your system, you look at the whole entire system overall and, and what facility can take what, I think it, it makes it, the conversations that much easier. Yeah, I love that you said it, you're able to share that quality data back with those centers mm -hmm. um, outside of your network and even within your network. I think that's phenomenal. Let the data speak for itself in terms of what's happening, right? And, and how you're able to navigate some of those um, some of those communications and requests that come in for patient transfers to appropriately direct them to mm -hmm. the facility that they need to be at. And if they're in their hometown, you know, it was great to see Stephanie, you're absolutely right. That patient satisfaction of being able to stay there, not having to have your caretakers have to drive, you know, 40 plus minutes to a comprehensive center to visit their loved one, I think is a, is a definitely a big driver of the patient satisfaction element there. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you for that. Um, one last question we have, and I think we're gonna be wrapping it up here soon. Let me see if there's any other uh, burning questions here. One more is, are you looking at expanding into other areas beyond stroke? You spoke a little bit about this, Stephanie, um, in terms of user utilizing this recruit for some of the clinical trials that you all are enrolled with in aneurysm. Um, Wendy, what about from your perspective? Yeah, so we're, you know, again, looking from our interventional perspective with the PE, also, the cryptogenic stroke one that's coming out, I'm extremely excited about. Um, yeah. And, you know, spine, obviously the trauma one, you know, we, we kind of looked at, we're not a trauma facility, but because we do a lot of compression fractures and pain management in their emergency room, you know, those would, you know, those might be an opportunity for us. And then obviously the cardiovascular team, you know, we're wanting to to like partner with, even though that's not part of my responsibility, you know, obviously anything vascular goes together. So we're going to, to share the utilization of that and see if that's something that would help them rapidly um, identify and diagnose some of um, the issues that they're having. Yeah, and this leads right back to that first poll question that we had in terms of being able to standardize one vendor across all of your service lines at the system. Right. And right. does that make that easier, you know, for all of your teams to be in one, one communication platform or one solution that allows you to coordinate right. that care. That's wonderful. Well, thank you everyone, um, especially thank you to Wendy and Stephanie for sharing your valuable insights today. Um, you know, we've learned a lot about transformative potential of AI and how it can improve access to care for patients, how it streamlines care and how it can help your teams gain efficiencies across the board. 
the future of AI and you know is really helping innovative technologies drive change in healthcare. Um, and BizAI is at the forefront of this revolution. So we're really excited to partner with you all. I encourage you to take the next steps in exploring how Viz um, can be integrated in your health systems to improve patient outcomes. And definitely visit our website, reach out and stay connected so we can continue the dialogue. Um, I also don't forget to fill out the event survey. We'd love your feedback on this. And thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.